The Dr. Supercoach podcast is powered by Code Sports. You can find our weekly articles at codesports.com.au. Welcome back to the Dr. Supercoach podcast. You're on once again with Cheezo. Sitting down in the podcasting studio chair for the first time this season and I can feel the cheeks just settling in nicely. Now, Pistol is not here hosting the podcast this week because he's in Canada and I said, think of the children, Pistol. Think of the children, the poor Supercoach children that need your advice he says that he just doesn't care about you guys, so he subbed me in, and luckily I have the Captain Air Extraordinaire. I tried to make that a word. It's not a thing. It's Pig! Mate, how you going, champion? Very, very good. I'm loving this energy you're bringing. Um, I think maybe we had a good best 22 week and finally put some good scores up, so maybe we're feeling up and about. But, yeah, this energy you're bringing, uh, loving it. Keep it up. Well, you have to know that there is actually an embargo on me. I'm not allowed to be on the podcast I'm, until I'm in the top 10K. And I've broken through that little ceiling to be in there for this week. It's taken me a few weeks. It was a little bit of a slow start. Typical kind of 35, 50,000 terrible opening round one and two that I have every single year. Uh, but we were in the top 10K now. We're at 8391. Uh, after scoring a 23-21. I, I was actually 23-23 before Steele got scaled down and the symmetry is lost and I feel like quite disappointed. Um, but I'm only 140 points from 1400th. So I'm not I'm 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 st- I'm there and thereabouts, Pig. I just need another good captaincy score from you. It's all you, you basically got me in the top ten k, mate. I, I need another one this week, so I'm excited to to see your uh yeah your YouTube video about well, it. Well. Happy to help. I did notice, I was looking at your town, I did notice that you went into Heaney with the VC, which is my number one option, so I'm happy to help. And I think uh, I think there's going to be a few juicy ones this week as well. So I had a, tw- yeah. I had a 23-15. Um, I, was, I was following our scores closely because I had you all weekend and then Steele just went bananas for you and you just beat me by a few points. You never had me, pig. Come on, Had you mate. on toast. Let's, let's lay off the piggy dust. Let's lay off the piggy dust. Back to the trough. Uh, so I'm at 14, <laughs> rank 14K. So I've climbed a little bit as well. I feel like we must still be really bunched up because if you even yeah. had 100 points to kind of our total scores, we'd be well, well ahead of this. So... I'm still not too worried about ranks. I'd like to, you know, get cracking right up in there. Um, but I was pretty happy with the 2315, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and particularly the last couple of weeks, um, I haven't ha- haven't been on for a, the start of the season, so I just sort of detailed my start. Um, started around the 50K, not the greatest opening squad. As I always say, people who are familiar with the podcast are familiar with me saying this. You can't win it in round one, but you can certainly lose it. And this was one of those years that unfortunately all my 50-50 calls, I thought I'll go this guy over this guy, were all completely wrong. So unfortunately stuffed the round one team, but we're fighting back, burning a few trades to get there. Um, so at the end of round two, I was into 35K, end of round three, into 15K, end of round 4K, end of round four. Um, I'm actually 81.36. I, uh, that was my accumulative points before. So I'm even even closer to the uh, the top 8K. Um, but I've gone through two boosts okay, yeah. and eight trades to get to this point pig because if they're going to throw free trades at us to make it AFL fantasy, then we might as well play in that sort of style and just chuck some trades. <laughs> Basically, I'm just throwing trades at it, just, you know, like – that pasture on a wall to see when it's cooked. I'm just pegging trades at my team, and at some point something will stick, and I'll be like, hey, this is half decent now. That's sort of my strategy, mate. <laughs> well, that, I think they're there to be used, aren't they? Um, you can't, yeah. That's exactly can't take, right. You can't take them into round 24 with you. Might as well spend them now. We, we talked about at the end of last year. We, we talked about at the end of last year that um, one of the things I learned was that I was too slow to kind of fix the mistakes I've made. I was like yep. playing a lot of the 30 trades and less style where you kind of sit on your rookies, let them make some cash, blah, blah, blah. 
And this year, I was definitely just going to be like, you know what? That's an error. That's an error. That's an error. He's not making cash. He's not making cash. JJ, you're out of here. Just throw a trade at him. Um, and that's that's sort of my uh, my strats uh, this week. Um, but yeah, Pig, it's really nice to be on the podcast with you, mate. I I just like I know you know this, but I just let everyone else know. Um, Pegasus is your name on my phone, and I've got that the from the from the Lion King when uh, when Simba's coming back to challenge Scar, and you've got Pumba going. They call me Mister Pig. That's the the ringtone. So if it, if anyone wants to, sees uh, that hears that in public, you'll be able to see my face if you look around. So. Uh, interesting things to, to finally sit down and have a podcast with you, Pig. I didn't want that to go over anyone else's head. Um, I'm just going to have to start calling, you, start calling you random times throughout the day. Like, you know, if I know you're at a doctor's appointment <laughs> or something, I'll call you <laughs> just for that ringtone. <laughs> uh, we do have some uh, housekeeping, Pig. Uh, no Patreon signups this week. Uh, so no one gets a, a shout out from uh, Pistol doing all the work recently, and we don't even have any cancer counselors. No one made any mistakes, any donate for donuts, any donate for dumb things. Everyone was perfect this week, and I absolutely love to hear that. Um, and I've just noticed, Pig, that we have two hundred and eighteen individuals that have chosen to give us a rating on Spotify, which I'm thrilled they have done so. And thank you so much. We're sitting at four point nine, which I'm I'm relatively proud about as well, Pig. So. Um, whoever gave us that uh, that point one off the the full five out of five, Pit, we're sending Pig, and he's going to take you to the trough. We're finding you. Yeah, we are. But also, when you look at four point nine, your brain just automatically rounds that up. I think that's all right. Yeah, that's like when you, you you're looking for um, a trip advisor. You see four point nine, you go, yeah, I'm going to book here. This is the hotel for yeah. me, and this is the podcast for people that suck at Supercoach like I do. Because we're learning from my mistakes, and that's that's the basis of every bit of intelligent thought that I have on this. Because it's always two weeks after I stuff something well, up. So that's absolutely top great. Top ten k, and <laughs> I've I'm aware of the pat, the patented Chizo chase down. So that's on that's it. this year. It's on every year. I'm just start. I'm starting like hey hey. I'm starting slow just so I can chase everyone down. It's just a euphoric feeling. Um, people like JB who always start hot don't understand yeah um, starting on again um we do have some interesting news uh this week pig um as we jump into the super coach content um the oh yeah here so zachy williams I, I i actually missed this at the time but apparently he had a little bit of ice seen on his hammy after the game on the weekend uh, Vossi said during his presser that he thought he would be fine. It's not too much to worry about. He was just having a bit of tightness. But we're under- we understand that he's going for a scan this week at some stage, but we haven't heard any updates thus far. Yeah, uh, yeah. Time recording. Haven't heard any updates. I think it's just a li- it's as easy as waiting to see what news comes out. I mean, he finally cracked an eighty for us this week. His break even still like seven. So I'd definitely be really keen to hold, and I think he's going to make a lot of money. But if he is out for multiple weeks, then there are you know options we can go to as well. So yeah, just wait and see. We always get concerned when it's Zachy Williams. Yeah. We just assume that it's going to be a six-week hamstring awareness. Yeah. That that it, it's it's concerning, particularly the week that he actually kind of showed. I mean, he still can't score in fourth quarters. But he actually showed a little resemblance of his future, uh, his past scoring, and what you know why we started um, him in our sides to begin with. That we were so comfortable um, at that elevated price, coming off the back of a, a seventy and then an eighty-one. He's only really had that one down score of the fifty-one. He's out of the three being seventy-three, seventy, and eighty-one. Like it, he's sort of performing in in the mold that we thought he would. Yeah, exactly. Doing what we thought plus has the potential to. I, I I still think he's got the potential to pop out a ninety or a hundred every like once in a while and boost his cash gen. So I'm definitely keen to hold if he's healthy. Yeah, so we'll keep an eye on that. Um, interesting as well. The uh, the buyers this week are going to be Sydney and help me out here, Pig. I've already Collingwood. Sydney and Collingwood. Sydney, Collingwood. Two important in uh, Supercoach teams as well. So um, we're looking at the likes of Heaney, Grundy, Jordan, Roberts, Dacos, these kind of guys. So um, going to be some interesting 
plays this week. Uh, going into the season, Pig, for me, this was the buy that I was most concerned about because I was loading up with a lot of Sydney players in particular. Um, uh, so, that yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I, I think I'm going to be throwing a few trades this week as well to make up because um, I'm going to lose my barnstorming run if I uh, I don't try and keep up with the pack and cover some of these donuts, mate, and, and some of these rookie... Oh, mate, can I just talk for a second? Go on. I, I realise I'm going off track. It's the first pod I've been on for a while, okay? Is that just Harvey Thomas and Jai Clark yeah. mixed with Tom Berry, Caulfield, Howes bear, like looked like he was going to score 20. I kid you not, halfway during the, the like, I have no cash gen from half of my bench rookies <laughs> right now. Like, Harvey, like, the one thing I did well this week apart from uh, taking your advice and putting the C on Heaney, was playing, of the four rookies in the midfield I had, I had Wilson, Carroll, Thomas, and Clark, and oh. I, I managed to uh, to play Carroll for the 66. <laughs> 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 I, I, I won the tiniest little rookie. I, I lost Buku and uh, and Darcy later on, but that, that little 11-point swing from Wilson to Carroll was, uh, was satisfying and actually got me above you too, Pig, if you think about oh, it, because there's only yeah. six points in it. Yeah, and, I'm going to be yeah. singing those Christmas carols all the way home from his 66. I love that. Um, <laughs> big. Uh, we've just got an update from uh, Jaden Poposki's uh, DPP. I think that's how you say it. Um, he's released his weekly sort of screenshot with the notable position changes um, looking likely at the end of round six. Um, we're only two rounds away. There's some notable names on there. The, the first thing that I noticed that there's not really any intruders coming into the forward line that we were really hoping for as you know previous years. It's still looking quite barren in terms of um, premium upside, which sort of my initial thought from that is that those that were thinking, oh, Sean Darcy's back, so Luke Jackson's got to go, or um, Adams and Parker are coming back soon for the Swans, Heaney's got to go. It's very likely that even reverting back to their old roles, they're kind of borderline top 10 forwards anyway. Because It's unlikely that we're going to have a whole heap of DPP forward premiums making their way in round 12 if we've got basically zero in round six. Would you agree? Yeah, it does seem that this first one, this post-round six, is kind of when the majority happen. Um, I think it has to be a pretty big change for it then to happen, say, after round 12. Um, but, yeah, you're right, there's literally no premiums that are going to be coming into the forward line. Um, there's, there's a bunch of names that are, but none of them are really relevant. The only relevant one is a rookie um, who would say being Riley Sanders. So yeah. that's actually going to be a really nice bit, probably be able to swing Riley uh, Sanders into the forward line, kind of plug a hole there so you don't have to field a Cabman or a Berry and can get a better kind of defender rookie in. But, yeah, no premiums. Um Unless, you know, you and I are pretty hot on Ben Hobbs. Maybe he's uh, going to suddenly average 90. <laughs> In a keeper league, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no... no... Uh, I'm taking the Essendon and bias away from that. I'm, I'm fairly confident he's not someone we're looking at at this stage. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, like, <laughs> if you look in the defender line, there was a lot of guys that people were starting in their midfield hoping they'd get defence, and it looks like pretty much all of them are going to going to pay off with that. So I'm talking about Nick Martin. There was a people that started Riley Bonner, Max Holmes, Carl Amon, Matt Roberts. Uh, they're all kind of going to likely. There's still two games to play, so, you know, it could change. But based on what we know so far, those guys all should get defender status. And uh, Pistol and I talked a bit about last week about don't panic in your defense line. if you've Even if you've got a Marty Hoare and a Zach Reed, for example, on the bench doing nothing, I think especially with best 18, you can kind of just survive these two weeks and then you've got DPP to maybe get rid of them, put Roberts back and get a better uh, defender rookie. That's an option. Yeah. Although I'm just looking at my team, I didn't also account for Nick Dacos's buy. So I've actually got three defender donuts right now, so I might have to, you know, maybe trade a whore to get someone. Um, but... Also, I could just go in with five defenders because it is best 18, not the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. And um, as you mentioned, a lot of the players that are 
sort of fantasy relevant in terms of the DPP. Uh, probably the likes of Charlie Combin, who will be forward defense. Uh, and it's also important to mention, this is info coming from JB. Um, I haven't seen it confirmed online because I don't really go on Twitter much anymore. So this is... Uh, at JB underscore DRSC, please tweet him if he's wrong about this. They need to play three out of six games to meet the uh, the DPP changes. So that's why the likes of Combin um, are there. Um, you also see Roberts with mid defense, McKercher mid defense, Buku Karmas getting forward defense, uh, Sanders mid forward, Sam Darcy. I wasn't quite sure if he was he was hitting the uh, the ruck contest uh, percentage wise, but um, Jaden's got him here as a forward ruck. Heaney, obviously, uh, Hayden Young, obviously, defender mid. Powell, forward mid. Uh, Closey is defensive mid. And Massimo is going to be defense mid for those that are looking to hold. And I've got to say, Pig, like a lot of these names are probably giving flexibility to our sides, which is something that I wouldn't say is naturally being built into a lot of our teams. Like I I have a, a singular mid forward swing and a singular uh, defense swing. Um, but that's more out of the players that are, it's, it hasn't been a deliberate thing. But the guys like having Roberts and stuff uh, and and Mass getting DPP, like the flexibility of our team in a fortnight's time is basically going to go through the roof and we're not going to be stuck picking rookies on a particular line just because we don't have that flexibility available. I think that's that's also important to remember as well because I'm seeing a lot of guys kind of, looking at like the brambles and, and you know, there's 300,000 got guys as sort of like a cash gen option. Um, but I think the, the added flexibility means that we'll be able to pick the most ideal rookie on any given week. Um, now that it coming, uh, that, that flexibility is. There. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it as well. And it also kind of, yeah, it means that you don't have to cop donuts. Like at the moment, if I've only got five defenders, if that was say now in round seven, you'd be able to swing it around and kind of get all positions filled. So, and a lot of these guys that we've kind of mentioned, you've just mentioned that are getting DPP likely, a lot of guys we already have in our team, like it's not guys we're kind of looking to trade in. Um, so it just kind of comes as a little bonus and it's going to be nice when it happens. Uh, and yeah. I think the Sam Darcy one's interesting because I think he's very heavily skewed by his first two games. I think he got a lot of rack time. This one just gone, I actually don't think he got that much. So... That one could change, but yeah. worth noting, hopeful. Well, I've got the uh, the ruck contest up here. In his first two games, it was a 61-39, then a 64-36, and then against uh, Geelong. Uh, and the reason that I benched him because I thought he wasn't going to get much uh, cheap ruck points. It was 82-18 to 18 in favour of English. So yeah. over the next two weeks, if he doesn't hit that, you know, he's only bordering on that 35 and, and and keep in mind, this is not just this is not center bounces. This is just um, it's all ruck contests uh, around the ground. Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, it, it's going. He's going to be really touch and go whether he opens up that that swing for players that don't have a Luke Jackson in their forward line already. Um, he may be opening up that that swing there as well, um, which is always handy in terms of injuries and stuff yep. like that, which we have. Um, but uh, this is something I, I do want to mention because I've had this uh, chat a little bit in um, in Slack. Is I, I had a few comments this week that were like, hey, Zach Merritt has started really, really well. Should I trade him in? And I, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think at this stage of the year, only four rounds in, a lot of the guys, let's take a steal, for example, are still sub 600K. So there's yep. not really any necessity to be paying I think Merritt's like 665 or 670 or something like that, you know, to be paying like full price as your first upgrade. Um, I still think I would be going, trying to grab as much value as I can in the likes of Steele, Took, et cetera. Um, Wanganee Miller are in defense over the likes of a Stewart or something like that. Um, the only sort of, I guess, breaking that rule that I can consider would be English, which I think is going to be English and Gorn are going to be a pretty clear one and two. Marshall, there's a little bit of, he has the scoring power, but whether he's going to be um, managed a little bit after the the reports on the weekend that he was absolutely cooked after the game. Um, I think there's been some some comments from Ross Lyon that he might have a second ruck coming to help him out. 
Um, that's the only sort of exception that I can see. Like if you've got Gorn and Grundy like many of us do and Grundy's got his buy, it's almost like a, a perfect opportunity to kind of grab English as that first upgrade if that's what you wanted, Pig. Do you, are you sort of seeing along the same lines? Yeah, I still definitely agree with you that it's still, like we're very early in the season, still hunt value. So um, even guys, yep. if people don't have like a Dan Houston, I would be pretty confident he's kind of going to be one of the better defenders and he's still under 600. I wouldn't necessarily grab someone just because they're underpriced if they're kind of not going to be top six defender, top eight mid, or at least close enough. Um, so when you mention uh, Mangane- Wanganeen Miller, I would only be trading him in if I was pretty confident that he can average kind of that 105 and be a good enough D6. If you're kind of worried that he might be like a 98 to 100 guy, I probably wouldn't do it. I know we have more trades this year, yep. but I still don't want to be burning them and then having kind of a D6 at the end of the year that's giving up seven points to my D6 kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you just need to work out. For midfielders, I kind of put the line as, do you think they'll average 110 from now to the end of the year? Defenders, I put it at 105. Rucks, I'm, well, rucks are going huge this year. It might be 115 or 120. Uh, forward... Oh yeah, easy. I, I think I think one twenty is like the 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 baseline for a, a English or a Gorn anyway. So if you're only getting a one fifteen, you're, you're yeah probably in that same boat. Yeah. So that's just don't just trade like someone in. Let's say it's I don't want to say Matt Rao because he's actually going really well. But if you're projecting Matt Rao to be a one oh five, slander him. Come on, go. <laughs> no, for I it. love Matt Rao. Uh, so. Like if you're projecting someone to go as a 105 mid, even if they're underpriced, I probably still wouldn't get them just because you'll probably have to trade them out. So, But if you, if it is Matt Rowell and you think he's going 110, just get him. Although he's not that underpriced anymore. He's risen. Um, so, yeah, that's yeah. where I sit with that. English, I still think, is going to be either the best ruck or the second best ruck. I, I do agree with you that English and Gorn are kind of one and two. Um, so I'm quite yep. comfortable paying up for English, especially like he has he has a reasonable run coming up. He didn't kind of dominate West Coast and Geelong like I was hoping he would. They were kind of two games I was really I actually traded him in two weeks ago for those matchups, and he kind of didn't really do it. Yeah. Um, Essendon this week kind of medium hardness, but then he gets St Kilda in round six, and Rowan Marshall does give up huge points to opposition ruckman, so that could be a big one. But then he has Freo, Hawthorne, Richmond, not super easy. So um, I still don't think it really matters. Tim English is one of those guys. Matchups don't matter a huge amount. I think you can just get yep. him. One of the questions with in the ruck lines, so there will be people wanting to hold Grundy. Um, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep dive into Grundy. I, 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 I can sense it on the tip of your <laughs> tongue. You want to do a deep dive just into Grundy. I'm going to let you go. For, I'm taking off the collar, mate. Run wild. Well, Pistol and I have talked about our bias with Brody Grundy because neither of us wanted to start him at the start of the year and we feel like we got tricked into that 130 uh, starting score and kind of fooled into picking him. He hasn't really done his job. I was actually really hoping that he would make us about 100K by now, by his buy, and then Ingress would come down and it would be a pretty easy swap, but it's still kind of 180K between them. So I'd say Grundy's kind of failed in at least what I wanted him to do. So there are people that want to keep him because his break even's only 83. So based on the break even, you could keep him, but most people don't have a playing R3, so you're going to be kind of a man down there. But the issue I have with Grundy is that he has his buy this week, so he's scoring zero. He then, after his buy, comes up against Jared Witts, who's the hardest ruck matchup in the game and limits people considerably. So I would not be expecting a Grundy ton at all. He then comes up against Hawthorne, yeah. and whether it's Reeves or Meek, whichever one's playing, they're both really good at winning the hit out. Um, they'll probably limit Grundy a bit in that regard. That's also at the MCG, which is a bit of a harder ground for Ruckman often that rely on stoppages. He does then... Oh, he gets GWS at the SCG. That could be a good matchup for him. But then round nine again, he gets um, Sean Darcy, if Sean does his back, which we think he will be. <laughs> we can't pred- we can't see that far in the future for Sean Darcy, mate. Come on. Yeah. So if Sean Darcy's playing 
that's the next hardest matchup in the game after Wits. So the way I see Grundy is that he's only got one easy matchup and four hard matchups, if you include the buy as a hard matchup, in his next five. So I actually don't really see him making any money for the next five weeks. And that's kind of what he was in my team to do. I wanted him to be a cash cow. So I'm actually quite mm. firmly to get rid of Grundy because you're just going to be giving up so many points to Tim English or Max Gorn, whichever one you don't have in the next five weeks. How do you feel about trading versus keeping Grundy? Oh, no, I'm fully on board. Like, as I prefaced the start of the podcast is with the amount of trades we have now, we don't have to... I mean, I still do all the Excel spreadsheets of week by week cash gen up until round 10, but don't tell anyone <laughs> I'm that nerdy and that I do it on company time. Um, but the the fact of the matter is, unless something drastically changes, he is continuing to just be a place setter. What better time to pull the trigger and get him into a play that you want? I, I see him no different to being someone like a Wines that I started the, the season with. I was predicting that Wines would um, enjoy... Port's start of the run run to the year, and even if he wasn't injured uh, and uh, with his hammy, he was already in the gun. You know, like I'd I'd already picked out and said, "Look, I'm going to miss out on Steel. He's got to go." Yeah, I was actually looking at, at Took and Steel, and just the way that my trades fell, I ended up with Steel over Took. Um, he was the one that I was probably sixty forty on anyway. But um, you win some, you lose some. But Grundy and Wines are sort of sitting in the same. Um, sort of ballpark where they're not really mid price a price that will make some cash if they just play mediocre. We really need him to be performing at a certain level to even be viable within our teams. And definitely against Gorn, um, he's had that uptick uh, in that round once and sucked all into us. But I, I was going to be picking him in it either way. So um, he was another one that I went into the season just thinking. And in terms of a super coach pick, I think he's washed. And yep. that's really disappointing because owning Brody Grundy over the years was a phenomenal thing to do. So it's sad to see that happen. But you've also got to be dispassionate about some of these decisions and just look at it for what it is and try not to bring, you know, I started him because of this and then I was emotionally caught up in that. And that's why just look at it at face value. He's not doing what we brought him into. He's now at his buy. We've had five four or five rounds of data now, it's a really easy opportunity to do something with them. If you don't want to go to an English or people, some people are looking at Marshall, which is fair enough, you've even got Meek this week. And I'd love to hear your hear your thoughts on Meek because he has replaced Reeves as the preferred ruck at Hawthorne. And he's been great the couple of weeks that he's been in. And so people are caught in this position where... We want English at some point, and here's a really good opportunity, but also we need to be taking as much value as you can. And if we can get a 110 averaging ruck for just over 300K, we, we've got to look at it. So I'd love to know your thoughts. I've got a few thoughts. And before we go to Meek, do we want to just, I want to quickly talk about the Marshall versus English because I think yeah, there's sure. a lot of people. Yeah, that absolutely. Have, go for broke. A lot, lot of people that have Gorn and Grundy. Uh, and then they're looking to get rid of Grundy and then they think, oh, where are we going? Are we going English, you know, 690K yep. or do we save 90K and get Rowan Marshall? Um, I'm probably just in the in the boat of I think English is going to be the top scoring ruck or at least the second top scoring ruck. I think whichever way you order them, I think him and Gorn and one and two. I just think Marshall is probably going to be giving up, you know, five to ten points on them most weeks on average. Marshall does have yep. um, kind of – Marshall, I'm, I'd am i be really keen that if one of these – I don't want them to get injured, but if one of these guys got injured, Marshall's like the next one you go to. And also Marshall's yeah. run after his buy is incredible. Like he plays eight of the nine games at Marvel and the one game he doesn't play at Marvel is at Adelaide Oval, which he actually averages better. So I'm kind of looking at Marshall as potentially an after the buy play. Um, because he still does have, you know, maybe a Sean Darcy matchup, a Lloyd Meek matchup, and a Max Gorn matchup, and a Jared Witts matchup before his buy. They were all quite hard. Um, so the way I'm seeing Marshall is he he'll probably keep doing what he's doing, like he's one fifteen average right now, and that's that's probably exactly where I see him up until his buy. 
I think he could explode after his buy and challenge these guys, but I just don't think the matchup's quite there. So I would probably just pay the 90k for probably 10 more points a game from now to the buys and then just see what see what happens then. Yeah. Okay, can I ask what your thoughts are on Tristan Sherry? Like he he's been a name that's been brought up. He's gone up 61k already and Lathas in team Chizo has been wanting to trade Brody Grundy to him in the last couple of weeks and my thought was very much the same you're going to want to end up with Gorn and English you're only missing English there's more value with someone like me I just don't think that a 430k I think he was at the time is really the trade you want to be doing Grundy for so um, I've seen a few comments that he's going to be the next sort of breakout Ruckman as well. But I still stand by that he's just too expensive to be playing that is he, is he not, could he, could he mm. not, when English is just straight there. I think if you wanted to do the cherry move, you should have done it two weeks ago before his price moved and he was at like a flat 400K. That yeah. was the time to do it. Uh, having said that, Cherry does have a really nice run. I think he has actually the easiest run of all these Ruckman kind of up until his buy. But he's also, I kind of touched on this in one of my pre-season YouTube videos, he's not someone with the, like he doesn't accumulate, he doesn't get many disposals, and when he does, they're always handballs. He doesn't get around the ground for many marks, so I don't think we're going to see like big 130s ever from him. And I mean, he had a 115 this week just gone, but he was a uh, tackling monster there at Norwood. So I don't think he's going to give you these spike scores. I think he'll just keep hovering like between 90 and kind of, 10, which is fine. I just don't think he'll make you the quick money like Meek may do. Yeah. Um, and you still need to use another trade because at the end yeah. of the day, we, we can all agree, we still want English and Gorn. Oh, 100%. I, if, if anyone is getting chariots as a cash grab, it's not like you do not want him in your team kind of after the mid-season buys when everyone else has English and Gorn and is putting... Like, I'm going to say that they could be putting 30 points on him every week. Yeah, yeah. So, no to Cherry for me now. Back two weeks ago, I probably would have ticked it off, but you've kind of missed 60K of price rise, and he was probably only going to rise 120 at best anyway kind of thing. Yeah. So, the one we can go to, and I don't mind this play, is Lloyd Meek. And the reason I don't mind it is actually... That that YouTube video I was talking about preseason, I was trying to identify breakout Ruckman and I was looking at kind of what uh, their, I guess, game style was and kind of how they accumulate their scores. And Meek was someone that popped up through my filter that I actually didn't really expect. He actually does get around the ground, gets some marks, gets some disposals, lays some tackles, gets a lot of hit outs. He actually did quite a bit more than I thought he did. And he's got some really, really good scores when he solo Ruck. Like, I think he only played three games last year when he was solo rough, but he averaged well over 100. So he's come out with an 88 against Geelong and then a 130 against Collingwood. He's got a break even of negative 14. So even if he gets his projected 61, he's going to make you 34K this week. I see Meek as probably someone that averages like a flat ton while he's solo ruck this year. So I don't actually know how much that makes you. Like, let's say Meek, his buys in round 15. So let's say he averages a flat ton to around 15. He probably does make you 100K or more. So I think that's that's an option. The thing you got to worry about with him is, does Reeves come back? Um, I think as long as Meek is solo ruck, I think we're actually really safe with him. He's going to score well. He's going to make us a lot of, a fair bit of money. I don't think they're going to go back to that dual ruck setup they had last year because they've got maybe a troll in now. Um, Mitch Lewis is, although he missed recently, but generally when he's healthy, he can also chop out. So I actually think they're just going to stay with solo ruck. It's just whether it's Meek or Reeves. And I think Meek's done nothing wrong and he's shown that he can be the number one ruck. So my preference, me, because I don't like messing around in my ruck line. I'm one of those set and forget lovers. I am going to, well, I'm not going to English because I actually went Grundy to English two weeks ago because I was sick of him. <laughs> two weeks ago? Yeah, I've had English for two weeks. Pull, I love that. Pull I, the pin, drop the grenade, beautiful. Yeah. 
Um, and I've been happy with that. Like English has dropped 20K since I've owned him, but I've also had English for two weeks. So I'm quite happy with that. And, and, and people that are always like, oh, but he's going to come down in cash and this and that, you already own him. It doesn't matter. They could, I mean, yeah. if they go to 400K, that's a bit of a problem. But if they fluctuate 50K up and down after a one bad game being in a three-game price cycle, just chill. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's it's non it's non existent cash because you already own him anyway. So it's an unrealized gain. Almost. Exactly. So I the way I play, and I wouldn't be surprised if the way you play is probably just to go up to the big dog, um, and just stop messing yeah. around in the ruck line. Pistol's already messaged me, and he's try he's he wants me to g him up about Meek. So if he listens to this, <laughs> I think you can do it. I think he can make you a hundred k. I think. So his next two matchups are going to be a little bit more difficult. He, he gets Wits, and then he gets Cherry, who are both pretty good hit-out Ruckman, so they might limit him a bit. But then he gets a really, really nice run. Like his round 8 to his round 13, most of those are really easy teams for Ruckman. So if he's solo Ruck, I could see him yeah, easily averaging 100. If that makes you 100K, and then you kind of switch to English or Gorn, who you don't have in that mid-season buy, it's a play. And it might be a play if you're kind of, if you like you mentioned and have a lot of what we were calling dead rookies and you're going to wonder where your cash gen's coming from. Yeah. That, that could be a way to, to earn some cash. It, it's not risk-free, though, because they could just bring Reeves back at any time. Yeah, and, and that's the interesting thing because they were both available for round one. Meek played in the VFL, played well. Reeves played in the AFL for two weeks. And yep. Meek has now had the last two games in the AFL, and Reeves played well on the weekend. He had 40 hitouts and kicked a goal from 13 touches in the VFL, so uh, in the most recent game that Box Hill had. So you're relying on him maintaining the number one ruck status, which I think is like a reasonable chance to happen. So in rounds one and two, Reeves had 84 and 76% um, of all contests uh, attended. And Meek had seventy four and eighty percent. But interestingly, from that, Meek's hit out percentage win was forty seven percent to Reeves forty one percent. Forty one percent is sort of around the slightly above average yeah. uh, in the competition. Um, from from what I can remember, um, Mabio Chol has had ten, eighteen, seventeen, and three percent. Interestingly, Max Ramsden. Um, who played his first game for the season on the weekend, had 17%. Um, so I, I, it's, it looks like they may have a little one-two punch uh, combination there because in the previous games we saw Mitch Lewis take some. Obviously, he didn't play on the weekend. But even Josh Weddle took a couple. Connor Nash was taking a couple. I assume they're like down the wing or in one of the pockets, for example. But on the weekend, and, and Chol was taking like 15%. Whereas on the weekend, Chol went down to like he had two contests attended, and then Meek and Ramsden did the rest. Ram- Ramsden had 18 contests attended. So um, it could be a clear indication that Mitch is tr- uh, Sam Mitchell is trying this little combination, which would be good for Ramsden as a, a, a rookie prospect, uh, and it'd be good as Meek being an, uh, you know the, the, the main ruck for Hawthorne. And while he's playing this well, it's also hard to see him getting dropped. So... The, the the only thing I would say, Pig, before we wrap up this whole Meek talk, um, given that he's on the bubble this week, is I think it's worth deliberately keeping a boost because there may be one week without warning where you need to get rid of him. And if yep. you've got all your trades allocated, you could be stuck with a $450,000 Meek sitting there that you can't do anything with because you've already got to prioritize other stuff. Yeah. I think so that's a good idea. If you're burning through if you're burning through boosts like no one's business, um I've gone through two in the first two rounds and and um not planning on burning for a, a couple for a while just to kind of get back on the right track very quickly. If you're two, three down by the time uh like you know by this stage, it might be worth just kind of keeping the powder dry just for that that one or two just in case something um, is there? I don't think anything's going to go wrong. If I had to put my money on somewhere, I think Meek's going to be fine. I think he's been great. He's obviously been great. That's why we're talking about him. Um, but I think it's also you've got to be cognizant of what can go wrong and how you're going to fix it as well. That's all part of our planning. Yeah, so I think just on that, I think the Max Ramsden inclusion was purely because Mitch Lewis was out from what I've heard from a couple of Hawthorne fans. And as soon as yep. Mitch Lewis is back, Max Ramsden's out of the team again. 
So I expect it to go back yeah, to sure. um, Meek being that main ruckman with Chol chopping out. Um, and that's kind of how I yeah. see it going, hopefully assuming Reeves doesn't come back in. So that's what you would want to hope for if you're buying Meek. So I don't know how you're going to source that, try and find out <laughs> if Reeves is a chance to come back. But I think he could make you quite a bit of money quickly, especially when we talk about round eight, like he goes Bulldogs, St Kilda, Port Adelaide, Brisbane, all easy teams. He has Adelaide, which are a bit harder, and then GWS again, which is easy. So he gets through the next three weeks, which aren't super easy, but then he gets an amazing run to make a bit of cash. So it's an option. I don't mess around in that line. Like I'm I'm already English and gone, set and forget. I think I had that by round three, so... I'm going to keep that. Look, I, I wouldn't be the one to accuse you of already messing around having Grunny to begin with, but some people might. <laughs> Not me. Some people might. Mate, oh, I um, got talking about sort of like sort of about um, players that are indicating a breakout and being an option for us, I want to know your thoughts on Horn Francis. Uh, $433,900 is obviously... Um, considered one of their leading CBA mids. Uh, if I bring up the numbers here in the, where is it? Two games he's played, round one and round four, he's had 71% CBAs, which was the leading midfielder. And then in the week just gone, he was 65%, which was ahead of Zach Butters, only behind Willem Drew and Connor Rosie. Um, indicating that that previous number one pick status, um, that Paddy Dangerville Dangerfield type explosive inside midfield player. Are we considering any sort of uh, breakout option? The the first thing that stands out to me is that's a pretty high price. You want to be pretty sure that it's it's going to be uh, a locked and loaded keeper. Yeah, so I am very very keen on Jason Horn Francis from a super coach perspective in general. I'm just not sure it's kind of the 110 plus averaging midfielder this year. Uh, if he had forward status, he'd already be in my team. Like I, I think I said in a video at the start of the year, if he had forward status, I would start him. Um, but he didn't, so I didn't. Um, but yep. when yep. I was doing my breakout um, candidate video for YouTube where I was trying to look at, like I think I had like guys like Chad Warner and Sheasel in there, someone else who came up on, I also had Newcomb, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, <laughs> although you're he had you're a his game. number one fan. What do you mean you don't want to talk about that? Actually, Newcomb had a good game this one. Gone. He's bouncing back, guys. Um, but <laughs> Horn Francis was someone that when I put the filters on and like looked at kind of the scoring profile, he was someone that popped up and said this could be a breakout. But I just kind of assessed it. I think I actually said in the video, it's probably half a season too early. So my thought was, you know, Horn Francis will probably have an up and down start to the season, maybe up and do his buys, and then I just had this feeling he'll really get it going post by and kind of like really intrigue us for next year. And that's probably still how I, I sit. I think he's still like, I know there are players and we talk about like kind of the Clayton Olivers that do break out this early in their career um, and break out to the 110 plus, but I'm not sure about the Hornet. I think he's in a midfield where there's so many good players in there. It's hard to see three of them averaging 110 plus because I do think Rosie and Butters do. Um, so that's the thing with Jason Horn Francis is because he's mid only, I think you do want him averaging 110 if you're picking him. You could get him maybe to kind of make you 100k like we wanted Ollie Wines to do and then flip him. That's a potential option, but I just still, same thing. I think there's so many mouths in there. I'm not sure he makes the averages enough, but he started incredible and to the eye test, he looks like one of the best players in their team. So I'm not doing it, and I probably wouldn't recommend doing it, but if you believe in him, yeah, he could prove me wrong because I think he's definitely got the scoring profile. My my gut feeling is it's just we're half a season too early. What do you think about yeah, I, I think I think that I think the thing that stands out for me is that Ken and Port, Port's midfield, they really... They're dissimilar to, say, the doggies in a way where they have a real set three or four, and they always have. They've got 
Horn Francis, uh, Butters, Rosie, Drew, and Wines all averaging above 50% CBA. So they're rotating five through there. And yep. then you look at Jackson Mead, who's averaging 26% CBA attendances. So um, it's go- he's going to have games. Like he's obviously the leading mid in terms of CBAs right now. I sense that there will be games where take Butters on the weekend, he was the lower of the four. He only had 50. The others had 70 and 60. And then another game, um, uh, the Hornet will have the the 40 or the 50, and it's going to sort of cap that upside. I would need to see a period of data of a month or a, let's say six weeks where doesn't matter who they play, doesn't matter who was injured, Wines had an injury, then he came back, then whatever – and he's consistently that inside mid, and it doesn't matter. The other guys are getting rotated around. Because um, you've got to remember that um, he's still a, a, a powerful half forward as well and can can go forward and impact the score So at the scoreboard. So like, it's not like he's just forever going to be an inside mid from now on. I think I need more data, and I think that 430 is too much to be taking a punt on someone maybe being a 110 average, which is what you really need him to be. Because yep. if he's averaging enough to make you enough cash to make it worthwhile, he's a keeper. Let's say you only need 100K, you're still needing him averaging just over 100 to, to make that by, um, you know, we're talking 105, 110 to make that by the buys anyway if you're looking to upgrade And him. then you probably wouldn't be trading um, him out if he's averaging you that. Exactly my point. Exactly my point. These guys are always the – like everyone – Brings players in, oh, I'm going to upgrade him at this and then I'm going to grab that guy. It's like it never happens. We've always got fires to put out and you're going to end up with a Horn Francis averaging 102 at your M7. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, it, 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 it's just one of those things. So I'm definitely not against the pick because obviously we've still got to take value. Like I said at the start of the podcast, and if he is going to be a 110 averaging player, he is incredible value. That's phenomenal. But the risk in, say, taking a meek for example, that has his role clearly defined and is a, a cheaper price point, the cheaper price point builds in a margin of safety. When you're already paying a 90 average for someone or 87 or whatever the maths works out to be and you need him to be 105, he's either a boom or bust. There's no room for error. There's no margin of safety if you do take these um, Horn Francis types. Yeah, if I had to put some kind of, I guess, guesses on Horn Francis, I'd say the first half of the year, I don't know, maybe we'll give him just under 100, let, let's say like a 98 average, but like you said, probably with a bit of variance. He'll have these big scores, whereas the main CBA guy, I reckon they'll, he'll have games where he's not playing that many CBAs because Butters and Drew are hot or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, I've just got this feeling that the second half of the year, he'll after the bye, he'll be looking really good, but probably still not enough to be a keeper. So. I wouldn't. I wish he had forward status. Um, maybe that's something we can pray for after round 12. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, no, no chance, I don't think. <laughs> well, um, mate, we'll jump into the next talking point I've got. Uh, obviously, we're still getting a lot of comments uh, regarding Dawson and the likes of Elder U. What are your thoughts on, on holding some of these guys? Because they're not, you know, I wouldn't say that they're, performing so terribly that we need to get rid of them immediately, but they're also not shooting the lights out to the point where um, they're performing to the amount of money that we've stuck behind them. They're, they're a very common player that we have started the season with, and I know we've talked this about another time, a, a few times this season already. Has your thoughts changed at all um, regarding the likes of, say, a Dawson or an LDU and these underperforming primo types? No, my thought's still the same in that if you think they're going to average 110 from now till around 24, you keep them. But I think what is changing is people's confidence that these players are going to average 110. So it's yeah. whether you keep them or not hasn't changed. It's whether you think they will be that player that you bought them for. Um, so we were having this discussion last week um, and Libba was in the same boat and then Libba came out and absolutely dominated. So he rewarded holders. And LDU and Dawson are the type of players that also could bounce like that and reward their owners. Um, Dawson I'm probably more confident in. I think he's like we've seen him be 115 for a prolonged stretch before. 
and he just still seems to be marred by his kind of kicking efficiency, letting him down, which is so unlike him. And I, I kind of do expect that to change. I also think Adelaide's midfield is not working and they need to change something. And whether that's a crouch gets dropped or a Berry is way out of there or something else, I still think Dawson's going to be their number one guy and maybe gets back to his best and as a captain kind of wants to lead that way. Sucks earning a premium and them having never not tunned for four rounds to start the year. Um, so, look, he has Carlton this week. That's going to be tough. Maybe not for him. He's actually got a really good record against them, but they're a tough matchup. He then does have Essendon and North, so he could have actually two really nice games there. So I'd probably want to hold him to see how he goes in those two games. LDU... I own LDU and I'm quite frustrated. And both of these guys, by the end of this week gone, will probably have dropped 100k, which is really annoying. Um, but kind of like you said, if you own them and you don't trade them out, it's not really money lost. It doesn't really matter. It's just if you trade them yep. out, you're kind of losing that money. LDU... Yeah, you're locking in a loss if you trade it. Yeah, LDU, like he started the year with a 121 against a very hard Giants midfield. He then got... Uh, Frio game, 105, middle of the pack. Carlton, he got tagged by Hewitt to a 67. Last week against Brisbane, he had an 88. He was actually lucky to get that. He was, just to the eye test, he doesn't look interested, if that's, it sounds a bit harsh. It, it looked it looked a lot like the preseason game against the Saints. Yeah, he just looked like I'm totally he was honest. going through the motions, not really, like, oh, maybe I'll pick it up, maybe I'll let George Wardlaw go get it. Like, that was the, his scores have annoyed me. But it's that lack of interest that is kind of scaring me a bit. But he does have Geelong and Hawthorne, his next two. Like, he's played some hard teams, especially GWS, Brisbane and Carlton. They're all really hard midfield. So his run's actually been really, really difficult. I'm probably going to hold him just to give him a chance against Geelong and Hawthorne midfields who haven't been great this year. So... I think I still believe in LDU averaging 110 from now until around 24. But the lack of interest in just the eye test hasn't been nice. Yeah. I I think if you're not getting rid of them this week, you're locking in too much of a loss to consider trading them in the future and you're just going to be riding them out. Because if if they're they're just going to be a a, a tonne average, which is sort of... You know, would be the 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 downside of what they are. Um, they're not great, but they they're going to be again one of those players that are your last upgraded. Um, so I I really do think that if you're not going to do it this week, you don't. And particularly this week, we'll get to the rookies in a second, but there aren't that many rookies to to kind of be looking at this week. This is the ideal week to to be doing something with them if you want to. And and just on Jordan Dawson, for example, his Year this year has actually been sort of crazy consistent if we cover the five, first five games he's had, including the preseason. So he had 29 touches, 26 touches, 26 touches, 27 touches, 23 touches, and they were all 20 and 9 uh, kicks and handballs, 18 and 8, 18 and 8, 19 and 8, 15 and 8. Um, he's averaging five marks a game, and he's gone... In in regular season, he's gone 6, 12, 5, and 5 in terms of tackles um, that he's had per game. All the numbers are there that he should be having a regular Jordan Dawson year, but instead he's gone 82, 96, 68, 99. Yeah, he had his most touches of the year last week against Frio and had his lowest score in SC. And in DT, um, he's averaging something like 110 flat. Yeah. So, like, it, it's not like he doesn't have the role, or he doesn't have. He's not getting the ball, or he's not getting tackles, or there's something wrong. He's just his efficiency has just been gross. Like he, he normal kicks that you would expect him to make, and oh, this is something I noticed, pig. A bunch of times in the game. So when you take an air, if if you miss a handball, um, or fumble the ball and end up just kind of palming it out into the open. 
um, you lose points for it. If you go to take a kick and you take an air swing and it just dribbles across the ground and you like fumble it towards your teammates, you lose points. I would be interested to know how many points he's lost off his super coach score as the season's gone. Because I swear against Melbourne, I saw him do it half a dozen times. He'd have no one near him. He'd evade a tackle. And as he's like trying to run away, no one near him. He just caught him. The ball would just like peanut, you know, buttery, slippery, slip out of his hands and fumble along the ground. And I'd look at his, um, his fan footy score and he'll go from like 63 to 57 i'm like oh come on all he did was drop the ball and then he picked it back up and handballed it but he lost points from that action yeah i you know like he he does it all the time and the fact that he's dominating in dream team and getting those disposals gives me some good faith for a bounce back it's just a frustrating hold i think i'd be more confident in his bounce back than ldu's just because of the kind of he actually looks like he cares um, but mm. yeah, both have at least in the next three weeks a couple of easier matchups, and I'd like to see them against those easier matchups. But I, another, uh, if I can yeah. just jump in with Jordan Dawson, he was the leading CBA mid for Adelaide for the first three weeks 84, 86, 82 percent. If you look at the stats for this week, it dropped to 59. You think, oh, like they just had a bunch go through there. No, he was the leading CBA mid at three quarter time. Then Sam Berry got subbed on and he played on the forward in the forward line at half forward because they were trying to use his delivery into the forward line because they were getting the ball forward against Melbourne, but they couldn't take a mark in the forward line and have shots on goal. So rather than using his kicking skills out of defense, they were trying to hit him up 80 meters from goal so they could hit Tex on, on the chest and it just wasn't working. And instead of when they started getting close towards the the end of the game, instead of bringing him back into the center, they just kept him at half four and they were playing Sam Berry. And Sam Berry is not the primary mid you want when the game's on the line. So um, he, you know, maybe we can have a 95 averaging Jordan Dawson as a DPP in round 12 pig. You never know. But that there was a very clear role change in, in the fourth quarter where he didn't have a single CBA. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they keep going with that. Um, yeah, they've got to do something with their midfield. It's just not working. But... Then one question, if you were to get off these guys now, it's kind of this is the week to get Jack Steele as well. Like it, last week would have been even better. But yep. he's probably going <laughs> to rocket past 600K after this week. So if you didn't have Steele and you had a LDU or a Dawson, would you entertain that? Yes, because I almost did it last week. Only I, yep. The only reason I held on to him and didn't grab Took also was because I wanted to preserve my third boost. I didn't want to go bang, bang, bang in the opening three when I didn't yeah. need to. I wasn't wasn't desperate. And I saw, like we're talking about, I saw the numbers. I saw the intent. I saw 27 touches and 10 tackles and went, oh, okay, look, he's going to turn it around. Like he'll get, he'll clean up his efficiency. Um, and I still I still feel that way. So I'm not planning on on moving him on. But for those that are scared off, I can still see that being a move. Because I'm kind of in that position with LDU. I could quite easily get him to steal this week or yeah. with a bit of a rookie change, I could even get him up to bond. So that's probably a decision I have to make. And it probably comes back to whether yeah. I think LDU will average 100 from now on and that's something I'll have to wrestle with. Yeah. I think LDU is still going to be a good pick over the course of the year. We'll look back and he averaged like 107, you, you know, something like that. But the, the difference between him and Dawson for me is we've seen Dawson be a premium for at least a full season beforehand, whereas we haven't seen, I mean, we kind of did see it last year and particularly towards the back end of last year, what LDU can do. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't call him a bona fide premium, whereas like Dawson... We're just waiting for him to just clean up his disposal efficiency a, a little bit, and then we just expect him to be one ten, one fifteen again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's I feel like it's a much that, easier that would be change. the difference. Well, reversal. Yeah, um, we're going to jump into some rookie talk now, pig. Um, first question that we've got, and uh, we've been getting this uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, is there's not a whole lot of rookies on the horizon this week. Um, looking at the cash cows from Supercoach Plus, um, the highest cash changing this week is actually Gorn, and then it's Lloyd Meek. Uh, oh, actually, I've got a filter by Rux. That's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> is uh, is uh, Jeremy Sharp and Tom Brown. They're both uh, moving about 
50K. Jeremy Sharp is uh, coming off the back of a 126. Fantastic game uh, for Freo on the weekend. Two, uh, $256,000. Um, and Tom Brown, uh, a 95 on the weekend, reset his break even. They're both in the negatives. He's now $214,000. Are you looking at either of these two in terms of a, a trading option considering there aren't really any rookies this week? Um, or is that price still sort of putting you off? For those two in particular, it's putting me off because I think next week there could be some cheaper options that could be really good. So sharp. Yeah. So, sharp. so you're avoiding paying up. You don't want to pay 260 grand for a Jeremy Sharp that might only have 100K left to make, if that, in order to wait an extra week to be looking at some of the, say, the Gold Coast guys um, that looked pretty enticing on the weekend. Yeah, that's it. And it, it, it is because of the position they're in. And it's because Jeremy Sharp's a midfielder, um, 255. Whereas in a week, if Will Graham keeps his spot, I think he had 17 CBAs or something, Will Graham as well. He was in the mid. Yeah. So when you could get him for 117 and will probably make more money or at least the same and your investment's less, Tom Brown versus Sam Close is exactly the same. You know, why would you pay 100K more for Tom Brown when Sam Close is there? And he looked incredible. He, I don't see any world where he gets dropped. He was amazing. So that, so in the defense in the midfield, I'm not really. The one I'm looking that I may pay up for someone that I've missed a week of cash gen is Sam Darcy. And that's just yep. because I don't like any of the forward rookies after him. So... There is Max Ramsden, who you and I talked about. He had a 71 because he got quite a bit of ruck time. But I think he's just placeholdering for Mitch Lewis, and once Mitch Lewis is back, Ramsden could be out. So it's the forward line where I probably may pay up for a rookie I've missed because I also missed Holly Dempsey. So I've missed Dempsey and Darcy, and I feel like I should correct the Darcy one. Even though he's already gone up 80K, he still has a lot of money to make. The... He's also the cheapest. Yeah, it's yeah. Well, that helps. the The one that we would have to probably get some intel from Brisbane Lion fans is Kyle Lohman scored an eighty eight and has a negative fourteen break nah. even at one sixty. Nah, small, nah, nah. Small forwards already elevated. He he's a, a, a past first round pick from a few years ago, but he just doesn't have that that extremely high upside. He's just had a good week. Yeah, okay. So where they where they absolutely bombed the Ruse. So. Um, pretty much as long as you played on the Lions team, you're going to get an uptick in your average points. All right, cheers, I've ruled him out. So <laughs> I think no fence sitting. I like it. Sharp. Let's say yeah. To recap, Sharp and Brown, they are options. I think you could still trade them in. They could still make you 100k. But I also think Closey and Graham will do that for cheaper and maybe more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sam Darcy's the one because I don't like any of the other forwards that are coming through yet. Like. Sonsi is now in the bubble, but he has not scored well. Yeah, um, yeah. There's not like short. There'll be a bunch of Richmond guys that that um, Lafau again. You can probably pick him up for 130k because he's scoring 30s mm. and he's not going to go up in price. Um, so yeah, I, I can agree with that. It, it's interesting the um, the Will Graham. He did have 17 CBAs on the weekend. There was a clear role change from Flanders on the weekend. He's now being played as a defender with Sexton. At, 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 particularly Sexton is out, but it may not just be his role. Um, but there's been some wholesale changes that Dimmer has made. Graham sent into the CBAs, uh, which is what he plays as 49 percent of the CBAs. He was their clear fourth. Um, midfielder on the weekend. So they had Anderson at 89%, Rao 77%, Took at 60, uh, 63%, and then 49 for Graham. Uh, Humphrey had 23 as well, but he was also the red vest. Um, and Flanders went from 56, 53, 39 to zero. Um, so not necessarily going to be concerned about Flanders because he's sort of got that seagull role in defense, or at least it looked like that on the weekend. He was just getting balls in the in the defensive fifty for fun. But if Graham continues to be that that CBA mid, um, it's going to be interesting. Well, he's a defense midfield eligible as well. So um, another another interesting one there to pick. We might have some DPP soon that yeah. um, would be allowed to cover the forward line and, and enable some of these guys. So basically, to sum that up. 
The rookies that we've got on the bubble this week are basically non-existent. You can go up to a Sharp, a Brown, or a Darcy, or you can look ahead to next week and potentially go early uh, on the likes of Sam Closey um, and Will Graham. You've all, all obviously got Charlie Combin, who is now playing as a key defender with Pink out for North. We definitely need to see another week of him. But we could come into next week where we've got the likes of Closey, Graham, Combin, all sitting there for the picking that, you know, we might want to boost. And suddenly we're doing a triple downgrade because they all become necessities. Common's a little bit more expensive, I think, like 215k. Um, but is there any, I want to know your thoughts, is there any legitimacy to say going early on a Sam Closey who looked the better of the Suns um, rookies and he's also only 102k, so he's bargain basement, it's hard to go wrong as long as he's playing. Is there any legitimacy to going early on someone so that we free up our boost trade for next week if those guys become must-haves. Yeah, I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that. I think um, Closey is the one I would do that I would go early on, and I actually probably am because, as I touched on earlier, I've only got five playing players in my defense, so I might go hoarder Closey to get a, another body. Um, but like you said, being 102K really minimizes that risk. If he does get dropped later, you know, Gold Coast play a lot of later games, so he could even just become a loop. Um, but he he looked incredible. I don't see him getting dropped. I think he's absolutely one you could go early. We don't like doing it because they could get injured. Anything could happen. But like you said, if if you're already thinking you're going to do three trades next week, some, something else could happen, like, you know, touch wood. One of your primos could go down injured and you've got to do a fix up there. So then you can only get two of them. So I would. And I think I will be, and I think it'll be closey because he's the lowest risk. Will Graham, he also looked pretty good himself, but I'd want to see another week of the role, I think, and just make sure he is what he is. Charlie Combin, I yep. think I'm actually going to be really, really keen on next week, but um, he actually has a really checkered injured history. He's He's barely played any games despite being in the system for years. And I think he missed pretty much all of last year with a like a really gruesome fractured ankle as well that he's kind of just got back from. So yeah. I actually, when lockout lifted, just traded him straight in to see how it looked because I could from Sexton. But then I actually did a bit of digging into his injury history and that scared me a bit. So I don't want to go yeah. early on a guy with that injury history. But the way he was playing, and especially like his first half, he was kind of okay working into it. He's trained as a backman all preseason. He used to play forward, trained as a backman all preseason. And by that second half, he was intercepting, clunking everything, looked really confident. He would just get the ball and bomb it out 50 metres as well. So that counts as an effective kick in super coach. He's not just trying to pinpoint something. So Unless unless it's a direct turnover. Yes. Yeah, good point. But... um. He, yeah, 129 from doing that a lot, 25 disposals. And let's be honest, the ball is going to be in North's back half a lot. So he's going to get a bit yeah. of the ball. He is still kind of key defender, so there is risk. But I don't think he's like a Charlie Pink key defender. I think he can actually get his own footy. He's a bit of a talent. I don't know if you've seen the physique on him. He's got yeah. some big arms. That's kind of – I don't base my whole team around that. But, you know, when I'm looking to trade someone in, I do look at, you know, I want, some, I want the good, good-looking guys in my team as well. 2025, pig trades in Chizo and his team. Interesting. Um, the one thing <laughs> that I would talk about in terms of going early is that we have a very rare opportunity where everything is sort of coalescing at the right time to give us some extra protection. Let's say close is dropped in the following week. Um, What's that going to be? Round six. Let's say he doesn't play round six and we're, we're sort of buggered. It's still going to be a, round, a best of 18. So it actually gives you a fortnight to fix yep. it. And not only does it give you a fortnight to fix it, we suddenly have DPP. So the likes of Hoare and Howes are going to get traded out. Uh, you're going to have the likes of McKercher and, and uh, Buku Karmas and these guys that suddenly get defensive status. Roberts as well. It's going to be quite easy to, to fix these guys. And with... Um, uh, Closey is probably going to get mid DPP if he does play three games up until round six. So let's just, for argument's sake, say he's dropped in round seven. He's going to have like DPP within himself, and he can suddenly become an M- M11 and and be that kind of um, late playing 
loop as well. Um, so it, 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 I wouldn't normally do this, and it's only probably in the last two years where we have such a, a, a staggering amount of trades as to what we've had previously that I would go early on someone like this. And we get burnt all the time. We saw Blake Drury burn half of the like half of Slack sure. last year. So it's 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 not to say that this is going to be a foolproof thing. But at least it gives you potentially a fortnight plus the additions of DPPs to our other rookies to deal with it. Um, and for that reason, at 102k, it's hard to really say no with the likes of um, him versus, say, a Sharp or a, a Brown, excuse me, who have that elevated price. So, yeah, um, fully agree. Yeah, I, I, I would be. Happy going early on closely, but he'd be the only one. And, and you know, let let's not not disrespe- uh, disrespect. Uh, forget the fact that Max Ramsden might end up actually being in the team. Let's say Mitch Lewis is out for longer than we thought. Mm-hmm. Toby Conway, if he plays this week, is going to be on the bubble the week after. Uh, Harry Hustwait uh, with the Hawks just had a three, so his one eighty starting price is going to come down over the next couple of weeks um, if he continues to be the sub, green or red vest. There, there could be the chance where over the next two or three weeks we get some of these rookies. So um, I'm not necessarily enticed to to pay up chasing that extra, you know, 60 or 70K that Sharp probably has left to make because I think it's pretty obvious he's going to drop back to that 70 average, yeah, uh, which is still going to be fine. But a 70 average is really only going up to 350, once that, particularly once that 126 rolls out. So you're trading in someone for 100K, which is, you know, it's perfectly fine. Um, but I think the same thing can be if, can be done with um, going early on closely. That's that's the the only added protection that's maybe leaning that way for me. Yeah. What about Sam Darcy? Do you think it's too late for him? I don't mind Sam Darcy. I don't think it's too late. I also like the um, the DPP edition that he potentially has. I'm still scared a little bit about Lob. Um, obviously, yep. Lob is still playing the VFL and, and playing quite well. Darcy, as long as he, I mean, he got the rising star this week, so I don't think he's getting dropped. But there's definitely the potential in close games, and I thought it was a chance against the Cats, which is why I didn't field him over Karmas, is I thought that if they're in a close game or they're getting flogged in a game and they need some more run, and you've got, say, Jack McRae as their sub, it would be very easy to sub a tall rookie off their field to bring on more run. The obvious person in that scenario is Darcy. So that's the only thing that sort of worries me is that he could have his cash gen stifled because Bevo does Bevo things because I'm Bevo. Very, very possible. You know, so um, I I think it's another one of those scenarios that going into it, as long as you're aware of what the risks are, so you're not taken by surprise, oh my God, are you kidding me? He got subbed for 30. As long as you're aware of it, you go, damn, I knew that was a risk, but I was I, I summed it up and took it and I wanted him over the other two. That's totally fine, but the, the risk still exists. Jeez, you just talking then made, makes me want to not get him. <laughs> just being on the Bevo team. Um, yeah. Look, we are going to have uh, Jack McRae at 300k uh, to upgrade after his buy in round 15, so that's going to be interesting. Um, <laughs> mate, I do want to talk about one more primo forward um, before we sort of wrap up this week's episode, and it was the impact that um, Adams had on Heaney returning. Now, Heaney led the midfield for the Swans over the start of the season, so um, in round zero, he had 58% CBAs, then 64, 74, 72, and then 55 on the weekend. Adams only had 21% CBAs, but you have to imagine that as his fitness builds, that's going to be increasing um, and then is the the likelihood of Heaney being moved out of that midfield, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because based on the game, it looked like he was spending a little bit more time outside, but that could also be because he was, they were just running some legs into some extra players through there. Even James Jordan had an uptick to 21% CBAs, and that could pretty much account for it. Well, the way I actually saw the game was that whenever Heaney was in the CBAs, he was getting pretty close attention from Elliot Yo. And they were moving yep. him around to a half forward flank or a wing to kind of try and break that. So I didn't actually think it was um, the returning players that kind of kicked him out of there. I thought it was more just how the game was going. He still like had a, what was it? it? Must have been like a hundred point second half um, to get to that score. So 
I'm not too worried. And kind of like you said, when we're talking about DPP, there's no real intruders that are going to like bang the door down to be a top six forward. So even if Heaney moves forward, even if it's it won't be as permanently as he used to be, I'm pretty confident in that. You'd, he's probably leading the Brownlow medal at the moment. I don't think you're just going to get him out of that position. But even if he moves forward a bit, I'm yeah. pretty confident he's still a top six forward. So I don't really have any concerns with Heaney. Um, from what I saw anyway, it was just that he was kind of, they were trying to shake that yo tag. Yeah. I, I think if we're if we're truly honest, over the last ten years where we've all we've all been crowing for this to happen, that he'd become a, mm-hmm. a full time midfielder and they haven't there hasn't been a necessity kind of for him. But we've always known that he's had the pedigree in order to do that. I think what the likelihood is is that he might have some yeah, he's averaging sixty five percent CBAs at the moment. He could potentially come down to about a fifty percent, which is still phenomenal in terms of scoring potential. Um, and he'll sneak up forward a little bit as the likes of Parker and Adams return to that midfield. But I don't, I definitely don't see the 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 days gone um, of you know twenty twenty three where he uh, did he even I don't think he even had a single one in twenty twenty three. He didn't have a uh, what twelve percent he was averaging in twenty twenty three. Yeah, that's um, not happening with one game one one game in round thirteen where he had uh, seventy six. So he had. Eight percent, three percent, fourteen percent, three percent, eleven percent. So he's in for like one or two a game. I don't think we're returning to that, no. considering that he's quite honestly, as you mentioned, leading the brown low. I think that the Swans will be forced to play their mid, like the guys in the midfield that can only play midfield. Like the uh, Parker can go forward, so that's that's a bit unfair. But like um, Taylor Adams and such, but I don't see him dropping back to you know twenty or twenty five percent CBAs. I think that would be. Absolutely obscure. Yeah. Uh, no, for, I agree. For I'm, to do I'm not, I consider Horse to be a decent coach as well. I'm not worried about Heaney. I've got yeah. a uh, cool a potential few just real quick fire. Are these guys top of their lines for you? Yep. Just off the bat, uh, Dane Zorko top six forward. Yes or no? No. No. Is that injury worries, or you just don't think he'll average ninety? Um, he loses five points for game for being a flog, um, <laughs> in my, in my book. He's always had the scoring pedigree in the past. I see him more as a 85 to 90 as a best case, um, okay. with the added injury and suspension risk, um, uh, cause you'll do something stupid as the year goes on. So, um, he's, I, look, he's not someone that I'd be trading into. Like, a, like if you're looking at me and you're like, oh, okay, well, there's no rookies this week. I'm going to do an upgrade. There is no way that Zorko's at the top of my list. He's already 500k. If he becomes a premium, he's going to be a 500k premium in 10 weeks' time. Get him then. All right, Jeremy McGovern. Can he average 105 and be a keeper defender? Ooh, he's getting a lot of ball. Um. I actually think he can. He's averaging 122. He seems to be the main guy back there taking all Hearns I, kicks. I, I'll, I'll say. I'll, I'll tell you why. That that's exactly you've hit the nail on the head. I think he's got a huge uptick because he he takes a lot of the kick ins now. So he let's bring up the numbers. So yeah. So without Withered in there particularly yep. in the last three weeks, he is solely split it between he and Liam Duggan, and he has only missed one out of 24 kick-ins. So out of 24 kick-ins, he's played on with 23. Yep. So he knows what he's doing. He knows where the free points are at. Um, I think he can. Yep. As, we've seen, as we've seen with designated kick-in takers, um, it's free points. Plus, I- He's obviously an elite intercept defender as well, so that you know that's super coach gold as well. Um, let me just check his price. I think it was 555 or something. So I think he... So oh, five fifty five. So based on what you've said, he could be actually be a trading target for people at that price. Five fifty five. Would I be paying five fifty five for that price? He does. I reckon come with a slight injury risk a little bit, but I re- I reckon at five fifty five, there are a bunch of guys at his price that would be more tantalising. I- don't know off the top of my head, but I feel like Whitfield's around that price. Houston's not much Let's more. Let's have a look. Uh, Dacos five sixty, Whitfield five fifty. Just imagine if you could buy Dacos for 
under 550 in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you, you'd definitely be able to. Um, Hayden Young, 520. Jordan Clark, 515. Wang is 513. So there's certainly some numbers around him that are half decent. Look, I don't, I don't mind it. I just don't, I don't think he's at the top of my list. I'd be looking at the, like, if I was going to be doing an upgrade this week, again, paying 550, I don't think he's the guy that I'm, is jumping out ahead of me. Yeah, that's fair. I, you know what I mean? I, first upgrade of the year, I'm going to grab Jeremy McGovern. <laughs> no, it just it doesn't. It feels wrong. Doesn't quite gel. It doesn't quite vibe. I reckon there's there's some bona fide premiums that have done it before that are offering similar value. I still think he's going to be good. I still think at some point we're going to be trading him in, but I don't think he's at at such a discount that he's a, he's a steal. You know, yeah. we're paying what if he becomes a, a premium, we're paying like what maybe forty k extra down the down the down the road. Yeah, there's pretty much thought, no defenders yeah. generally that. Don't drop under six hundred. So, he'll, like you said, he'll probably be around five eighty available again. But I think I think we're sleeping on him a little bit. I think he's in for Definitely. a really good year. And then yeah. uh, he's got to be like the the third highest averaging defender. Yeah, he's killing it. Yeah, he is. That's awesome. And then last one, uh, Matt Rao. Can he be a one ten averaging mid this year? Yeah, definitely. I think he can. Yep. I, I I think it might have been two years ago that. A lot of us started him, and he let us down being like a 60 or 70 average. Yep. Um, so the pedigree's always been there. We always knew that he was going to break out. He's obviously got that, um, everything he needed, like his development, his his tank, everything he's putting on muscle. He's now one of their inside bulls. They've got three main midfielders, and it's only the fourth midfielder that gets kind of rotated, like in a bulldog style where they've got a main three. I, I think he can do it. I think he, I think the fact that he's so inside probably caps his upside a little bit in that I don't think he's going to end up being able to do like a 120 average, uh, but I definitely see his potential to be a 110. Awesome. So Zorko, no. Rao and McGovern could be. Could be. Sweet. I know, I know we said no fence sitting, but that's what I got for you. I like it. Pig. This has been a great... First pod to come back. What a to pleasure! This year, so um, I appreciate you sitting down with me, mate. Um, as we always wrap up the end of the podcast, you can find us on Twitter at Doctor underscore SC, Chizo at Chizo underscore DRSC, JB at JB underscore DRSC, Pistol at Pistol underscore DRSC. And if you're noticing a pattern, you can figure out pigs without me having to tell you. No, it's at pig underscore DRSC. Thanks everyone for listening. Good luck this week. Um, let me know your trades. I, I don't have anyone DM me on Twitter anymore because I'm uh, I'm washed. I think was what one DM told me uh, twelve months ago, and I kind of agree. Um, <laughs> so if you've all enjoyed this episode, let me know how washed I am. We'll catch you all in the next episode. Good luck this week, Pig. Thanks for sitting down. We'll catch you all in the next episode. Bye.